Christopher Baldner. As Christmas approached in late 2020, Tristan Goods and his wife packed up their two kids and headed north from their Brooklyn home to visit some relatives in upstate New York. They were driving along Interstate 87, about 95 miles or 153 kilometers outside the city, when state trooper Christopher Baldner pulled them over for speeding in Ulster County. It's unclear what happened during the stop, but at some point, Baldner sprayed pepper spray into the family's SUV. Goods allegedly sped off, and a chase ensued. Baldner rear-ended the vehicle twice. The SUV struck a guardrail, rolled over multiple times, and came to rest upside down. One of the children was ejected from the vehicle and lost her life, while the other child sustained serious injuries. Nearly a year after the accident, Baldner was charged with second-degree murder, manslaughter, and multiple counts of reckless endangerment. Five of the eight charges are in connection with the Goods tragedy, and three stemmed from another alleged ramming incident that occurred in 2019. In a statement, Attorney General Letitia James accused Baldner of using his car as a deadly weapon, while the union representing him said that it planned to fight the charges. He remains suspended without pay, pending the outcome of the allegations. To describe the case as complicated would be an understatement. According to the most recent update, Baldner's attorneys have filed motions challenging several details in the indictment, and he has yet to go to trial. 8. Brian Glenn One night in early 2021, 71-year-old Alaska resident Bob Bodell was riding in an SUV with his friends Eric and Katie Haddock when the vehicle ran out of gas in the town of Soldotna. Eric parked at the base of a long residential driveway, and he and Katie left on foot to buy gas while Bodell, who struggles with mobility issues, waited in the SUV. After noticing the vehicle at the foot of their driveway, the homeowners became suspicious and called police. State Trooper Brian Glenn, who had graduated from the police academy just six months earlier, responded to the scene. It's unclear exactly what happened during his conversation with Bodell, since his regular patrol car was out of service and he was using a car with no dash cam. But Bodell later claimed that he explained why the SUV was sitting there and why he was in it that Glenn didn't seem to believe him and repeatedly accused him of being the driver of the vehicle. Glenn submitted a partial audio recording of the exchange into evidence. However, he failed to hit the record button before approaching Bodell, despite the police manual's recommendation to begin recording before interacting with the public. In fact, by the time Glenn began recording, the conversation had already become heated leaving out what happened in the moments leading up to it. At some point, the disagreement became physical, and Bodell was charged with disorderly conduct and assaulting an officer. He maintains his innocence and has accused Glenn of using excessive force, claiming that the trooper tased him, struck him, and sprayed him with mace for asserting his right to remain silent. Speaking with local station KTUU, Bodell said that the ordeal has left him with memory problems and uncontrollable shakes. He now relies even more on his caretakers than he did before the encounter and can no longer ride his four-wheeler and do other things he once enjoyed. However, there are always two sides to every story, and the Alaska State Police, ASP, and the State Department of Public Safety are standing by Trooper Glenn who they say was just doing his job. They accused Bodell of being the aggressor, but the case against him was dropped. Glenn resigned from his position in early 2022, but the agency maintains that his decision to quit had nothing to do with the Bodell case. 7. Kasha Domingue In July of 2018, Louisiana State Trooper Kasha Doming pulled a car over behind a grocery store in Baton Rouge for making an illegal U-turn. During the traffic stop, the vehicle's unarmed passenger, 19-year-old Clifton Dilly, tried to flee the scene on foot. Doming shot him, leaving him partially paralyzed. 
and was immediately put on desk duty following the incident. It was her second use of force that day, after using her stun gun on another civilian during a traffic stop for not having a license plate. After shooting Dilly, Doming incorrectly told dispatch that she had used her stun gun on him. Dilly would later allege in a lawsuit that this slowed the emergency response. Doming was indicted a few days later on charges of second-degree battery and illegal use of a weapon, and was accused of giving investigators conflicting accounts of what happened. Following the indictment, she was put on administrative leave. In the meantime, the Louisiana State Police conducted an internal investigation but revealed very little about its findings or any disciplinary action that was taken. Deming struck a deal with prosecutors and pleaded guilty to a reduced misdemeanor charge of obstruction of justice. She was sentenced to six months of probation and was required to sign an agreement promising to never work in law enforcement again. 6. Jennifer Daniel. The future seemed promising for Jennifer Daniel when she graduated from New York State Police Academy in 2016 and began her career upstate in Oneida County. However, she veered down a wayward path just two years later, when she posed as a man on the Plenty of Fish dating app and began a long-distance relationship with a 33-year-old woman living in Long Island. During the three months that the pair corresponded, the victim sent intimate photos of herself to Denyo while under the false impression that she was talking to someone else. The already bizarre catfishing scheme took an even stranger turn when Danyo threatened to post the images online if the victim didn't travel to New York City to buy a fake ID. An investigation by police in the city of Rome found that the fake profile Danyo used in this particular case was just one of several fake IDs she had created online between 2016 and 2018. By the time authorities charged her in connection with the Long Island catfishing case, she was already facing charges in Rome for allegedly harassing another woman online for 15 years. The victim told police that she began chatting with who she thought was a man named Michael in 2003. Over the years, the online relationship became increasingly abusive, eventually culminating into a living nightmare. The case against Danyo in Rome was ultimately dismissed, but she pleaded guilty to misdemeanor coercion in the Long Island case and was sentenced to three years of probation. She also no longer works in law enforcement, much to the relief of those whose lives were affected by her alleged crimes. 5. Charles Hewitt In a disturbing arrest that was captured on video in 2019, a Virginia state trooper threatened to hurt an unarmed black man and forcefully yanked him out of his vehicle during a traffic stop in Fairfax County. The unprovoked act of aggression occurred when troopers pulled over 29-year-old Derek Thompson for having an expired inspection sticker. Thompson recorded the entire interaction with his cell phone. In the video, he can be seen calmly telling trooper Charles Hewitt that he was not a threat and that his command for him to exit his vehicle was unlawful. Even though Thompson was refusing to do what he was told, he kept his hands in the air and remained peaceful throughout the conversation. He insisted that he had no violent or bad intentions and that he was simply asserting his right to remain seated in his car. Hewitt nevertheless became irate and began yelling in Thompson's face, at one point threatening to, quote, whoop his ass. The trooper eventually told Thompson that he was under arrest, looked directly at the man's camera, and said, watch the show, folks, before taking him to the ground. Shortly after the video surfaced, Virginia State Police, VSP, Superintendent Colonel Gary Settle condemned Hewitt's actions. Thompson pleaded guilty to misdemeanor obstruction of justice in the case, but sued the state for violating his rights and received a $20,000 settlement in 2021. Around the same time, Hewitt resigned from his position. Although the settlement didn't require VSP to admit any wrongdoing, Thompson's attorney said that his client was satisfied with the outcome 
and that he believes Virginia is safer without Hewitt on the streets. Four, Jacob Toll. After learning that his daughter and her child may have been subjected to violence at the hands of the woman's boyfriend in 2022, a concerned father called the police and asked them to do a welfare check at the couple's home in Madison, Indiana. The woman's father reported that the victims had been thrown from the home by 33-year-old Jacob Toll, an Indiana state trooper who was off duty at the time. Apparently, Toll had been drinking that night, which only makes matters worse. The victim reportedly told responding troopers that she and Toll got into an argument after she poured his alcohol down the drain. She accused him of grabbing her by the back of the neck and choking her until she could no longer breathe. She also said that he went after her a second time when she tried throwing some bottles of liquor in the garbage. The woman's son said that he was scared that Toll was going to kill his mother during the disagreement. Toll faces multiple felony charges, including domestic battery in the presence of a minor, strangulation, and communication intimidation. He's currently suspended without pay while he deals with the case in court. Three, Edwin Ramirez. Delaware State Trooper Corporal Edmund Ramirez was a highly praised member of his department until 2021, when one of his supervisors discovered some discrepancies in an accident report. After serving on the force for six years with an unblemished record, he was suspended with pay while his superiors investigated the matter. They examined patrol footage of vehicles that Ramirez had issued e-warnings and e-tickets to, through the state's electronic system and discovered that in many instances, no traffic stop occurred. In other words, Ramirez was issuing tickets and warnings to drivers who weren't doing anything wrong and in some cases weren't even pulled over. Over the course of just one month, the state justice department counted more than 30 fraudulent warnings. Two of his victims were fellow members of law enforcement. In one instance, Ramirez issued a warning to a state police employee who wasn't even driving at the time. In another, he issued a warning to a Sussex County police officer for allegedly driving off the road. He cited a Department of Corrections worker for talking on his cell phone while driving, but never pulled the man over. And another victim was at home attending a virtual parent-teacher conference when they were ticketed for having illegal tint on their car windows. Some victims were stopped, but were unaware that they had received a ticket or a warning. It comes as no surprise that Ramirez had been awarded in the past for his so-called traffic productivity. However, his dishonesty came at a cost, including the loss of his job and a year of probation. Two, Harvey Briggs. 54-year-old Harvey Briggs was working as a Tennessee state trooper in 2020 when he ripped a COVID-19 mask off a protester's face outside the state capitol during a political protest. Briggs told the victim, Andrew Golden, a musician and activist, to get back, to which Golden responded by saying, quote, I'm filming and I'm on the effing sidewalk. Angered by the man's choice of words, Briggs allegedly replied, Go ahead and use that language again, young man. In a video of confrontation, the trooper can be seen approaching Golden and warning him not to impede the officers at the scene. When Golden tried to film Briggs' badge and asked him why he wasn't wearing a mask, the camera suddenly panned down to the ground, where Golden's mask was laying in the grass. Briggs denied ripping the mask off the young man's face and said that he was, in his words, tired of you people making stuff up. The footage went viral and the 22-year-old veteran was soon fired for unprofessional conduct and charged with assault. He sued the state over his firing, arguing that neither Golden's video or surveillance footage of the incident clearly showed him removing the protester's mask. In September of 2022, Briggs pleaded no contest to the assault charge and was sentenced to six months of probation. He mysteriously vanished from his home in Columbia, Tennessee the next day. According to police, he made several concerning statements to his family before he disappeared. A few days later, his vehicle was spotted in Okaloosa Island, Florida, 
and Briggs was allegedly seen walking along the beach. His lawyer declined to comment on the disappearance or whether Briggs had permission to travel, which is required under the terms of his probation. However, since the police can't find him, it's likely safe to assume that he vanished without warning. There have been no updates since early October, and police have appealed to the public for any possible information regarding his whereabouts. 1. Errol Oske In one of the more unusual law enforcement gone wrong cases to hit the headlines in recent years, a New York state trooper found himself on the wrong side of the law for allegedly trying to swindle Walmart for a free children's toy. While off duty one day in September of 2022, 36-year-old Errol Oske bought a riding toy from a Walmart in Watertown. He came back to the store the next day and returned it. However, while handling the merchandise, asset protection employees noticed that the toy inside the box was visibly worn, indicating that it was much older than the toy Oske had purchased the previous day. Suspecting that he kept the new toy and returned one that he owned for quite a while, staff members called the police. Oske was charged with one felony count of falsifying business records and misdemeanor petty larceny. He remains suspended from his job amid an internal investigation into the allegations against him. Nine, Daniel Camargo Barbosa. Daniel Camargo Barbosa, also known as the sadist of El Charquito, gained international notoriety for a series of horrific murders he committed, starting in 1973 in Colombia. After spending eight years in prison for assaulting past victims, he had vowed to make sure that none of the people he attacked in the future would live to talk about it. It's believed that Barbosa killed as many as 80 young women before he was finally connected to some of the crimes in 1974. He was convicted of just one murder and received a 30-year sentence that was later reduced to 25 years. In 1984, Barbosa escaped from Gorgana Prison, which is known as the Colombian Alcatraz. Staff members assumed he'd been eaten by sharks, as the entire facility is surrounded by water. But he was very much alive and headed to Ecuador, where he immediately began murdering again. Barbosa killed so many people in Ecuador that police initially thought his crimes were being carried out by an organized gang. He was finally captured again in 1986 and received a 16-year prison sentence, which was Ecuador's maximum sentence at the time. To the relief of many, Barbosa didn't live long enough to see freedom again. In 1994, a fellow inmate and a relative of one of his victims, Giovanni Noguera, stabbed Barbosa to death at the age of 64. 8. Donald Harvey Donald Harvey, also known as the Angel of Death, killed numerous hospital patients in Kentucky and Ohio between 1970 and 1987 while working as an orderly. He started murdering shortly after landing his first job in the healthcare industry and killed a dozen people in the first 10 months alone. Over the following years, he went on to murder somewhere between 37 and 47 people. Unlike most serial killers, Harvey didn't target his victims based on their background, gender, age, ethnicity, race, or physical characteristics. Most of them were cardiac patients, and he had a few choice methods for killing them. He injected cyanide, arsenic, or another poison into their feeding tubes, suffocated them, or turned off their ventilators. Harvey later claimed that he only murdered terminal patients, and that he did so to end their suffering, but that simply wasn't the case. Not all of Harvey's victims were terminally ill, although it was true that they were often not expected to survive the ailments that landed them in the hospital. In addition to killing hospital patients, he poisoned his roommate, lover, and two of his neighbors as well. He finally fell under legal scrutiny in 1987, after an autopsy on one of his victims revealed large amounts of cyanide in their system. Harvey ultimately pleaded guilty to 37 murders, although it's believed he was responsible for many more. 
As punishment for his horrific crimes, he received three life sentences. However, he was found badly beaten in his prison cell in 2017, and he died from his injuries two days later. His killer, fellow prisoner James Elliott, wrote in a letter to the news journal that he was trying to get the prison staff's attention and was disgruntled over the quality of the food that was being served there. He reportedly planned to stab Harvey, but beat him to death when he cried out during the attack. 7. Edwin Caprat Known for targeting mainly elderly victims, the so-called Granny Killer murdered at least six people in Tampa and Hernando County, Florida between 1991 and 1993. His real name was Edwin Bernard Caprat III. Surprisingly, he was caught pretty early on in his murder spree and was even put on trial for the crimes. However, it was ultimately determined that Caprat's confession was unreliable and he was convicted of lesser charges. After serving some time in prison and the rest on house arrest, he was once again free to roam the streets. Caprat typically killed old people in their homes and then set the dwellings on fire. He often bound and beat his victims, and it wasn't too long before investigators began to realize that they were most likely dealing with the serial killer. As the murderers continued, local authorities called the FBI to help. An anonymous tipster broke the case when they called and told detectives to investigate Caprat. Sure enough, his fingerprints were found at one of the crime scenes. Police surveilled him until they felt they had enough evidence to tie him to more of the murders, then took him into custody. Caprat reportedly confessed to his crimes within a day of his arrest. He was put on trial in 1995, but he reportedly paid little attention to it and read a book most of the time. After convicting Caprat of two murders, the court sentenced him to death. However, he was instead killed at the hands of two fellow inmates who fatally stabbed him. The families of his victims were mostly relieved and any remaining cases involving Caprat were closed. 6. James Whitey Bulger James Whitey Bulger was a notorious Boston-based organized crime boss who led the Winter Hill Gang for decades. He fled the area in 1994 at the age of 65 after learning that the FBI had a pending RICO indictment against him. Bulger remained on the run for the next 16 years landing himself a spot on the FBI's 10 Most Wanted Fugitives list, where he was listed second only to Osama bin Laden. By the time authorities finally captured Bulger in Santa Monica, California in 2011, he was 82 years old. He was put on trial for 19 murders, along with numerous racketeering, money laundering, and extortion charges. During the trial, it was revealed that Bulger had been working as an FBI informant since 1975, and that he was playing both sides of the game for much of his criminal career. The agent who worked with him turned a blind eye to Bulger's gang in exchange for information about other organizations, including the Italian Mafia, which helps to explain how he got away with his lifestyle for so long. However, Bulger's willingness to help law enforcement only went so far, and he was ultimately convicted of 31 charges and received two life sentences. Just a day after he was transferred to the Hazleton Penitentiary in West Virginia in 2018, Bulger was bludgeoned to death by three fellow inmates. The authorities were intent on holding the career criminals' killers responsible for their actions, but the families of his victims weren't too upset about what happened. In 2022, 55-year-old former Mafia hitman, Fotios Freddy Gaius, 48-year-old Paul Pauly de Colagero, and 36-year-old Sean McKinnon were charged with conspiracy to commit first-degree murder in connection with Bulger's death. U.S. Attorney Rachel Rollins described the incident as the truest of ironies. And despite the decision to hold his alleged killers responsible, she expressed the Justice Department's solidarity with his victims. At the moment, the cases are ongoing. 5. Donald Leroy Evans 
Donald Leroy Evans was 29 years old when he was convicted of his first crime in 1986. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison for attacking a woman in Galveston, Texas. But he managed to regain his freedom after serving just five years. Following his release, Evans drove right back into a lifestyle of crime and violence. Within months of getting out of prison, he was wanted for murder and allegations of threatening to harm an ex-girlfriend. After realizing the police were looking for him, he stole a car and fled to Gulfport, Mississippi. But Evans couldn't resist committing another murder, so his life on the run was cut short almost immediately. He was charged with one federal count of kidnapping and faced a murder charge in Mississippi. A jury found him guilty and sentenced him to death. Nobody knows how many people he killed, but the number is thought to be somewhere between 15 and 60, and he's taken credit for murders at rest stops in over 20 states. Evans made one last ditch break for freedom and escaped from jail but was quickly apprehended and thrown back behind bars. In 1999, fellow death row inmate Jimmy Mack stabbed him to death in the shower. After the incident, Harrison County District Attorney Kono Karana said, we don't mourn him, we simply close his file. Four, Jeffrey Dahmer. Between 1978 and 1991, Jeffrey Dahmer lured young men into his Milwaukee apartment where he murdered them, then dismembered and devoured their remains. In 1992, he was convicted of 15 out of 16 suspected murders in Wisconsin and received 15 life sentences as a result. Less than three years into his sentence, Dahmer was beaten to death by fellow inmate Christopher Scarver at the Columbia Correctional Institution in Portage, Wisconsin. Scarver was a newcomer at the prison himself, having arrived the same year as Dahmer after being sentenced to life for murder. After completing carpenter training through a job skills program, Scarver could not land a full-time position like his supervisor supposedly promised him. This infuriated him. And as retribution, Scarver robbed and shot a staff member. His rage would come out again when he was left unsupervised with Dahmer and another inmate, Jesse Anderson. The men were tasked with cleaning the prison gymnasium bathroom. Scarver beat Dahmer to death with a bar he had removed from a piece of exercise equipment, then bludgeoned Anderson with a wooden stick. He told a corrections officer that God told him to commit the murders. Scarver suffered from schizophrenia, so it's possible that he believed this. It's rumored that Scarver targeted Dahmer because of his disproportionate number of African-American victims. It's also believed that he went after Anderson for trying to frame black men for the murder of his wife. And while it may not seem like a big deal that Scarver received two additional life sentences for killing Dahmer and Anderson, he filed a lawsuit accusing the prison of cruel and unusual punishment. He claimed that the murders landed him in solitary confinement for years. A judge eventually ruled for Scarver and several dozen other inmates with serious mental health issues to be relocated to another facility. 3. Thor Nis Christensen Something went terribly wrong in the mind of Thor Nis Christensen during his early adulthood when he began to fantasize about murdering people. In late 1976, he stole a pistol from a friend and committed his first three murders in Isla Vista, California. The victims were all similar in appearance, indicating that the killer targeted a certain type of person. The murders went unsolved, and Christensen moved to Oregon, where he fatally shot a hitchhiker. His fifth murder happened in Los Angeles in 1979, when he shot a woman named Lydia Preston in the head while they were inside his car. Preston was severely injured, but miraculously survived. She eventually crossed paths with Christensen at a bar in Hollywood and called the police. After arresting him, law enforcement realized that he was one of the 100 or so persons of interest they had investigated in connection with the Isla Vista murders. 
Detectives found enough evidence to charge him with the first three killings he was suspected in. Christensen pleaded guilty and was consequently sentenced to life behind bars. However, less than a year after arriving at Folsom State Prison, a fellow inmate stabbed him to death in the recreation yard. The killer's identity was never revealed. It's possible that Christensen killed more people than anyone knows about. Shortly before the three Isla Vista murders that he was convicted for, several women went missing in the area. But if that's the case, the true extent of his violence may never be known. 2. Albert DeSalvo Between 1962 and 1964, a killer nicknamed the Boston Strangler terrorized the city of Boston, murdering 13 women between the ages of 19 and 85. Most of the victims were brutally assaulted in their homes and then strangled to death with articles of clothing. At the same time, there was a man lurking throughout the city and attacking women, but he wasn't killing them. Police initially thought the Boston Strangler and the so-called Green Man were two different people. However, they learned differently when a survivor identified Albert DeSalvo as their attacker. He was brought in for questioning and gave a detailed confession of all his crimes, which included both the assaults and the Boston Strangler's murders. Because there was no physical evidence linking DeSalvo to the murders, prosecutors instead tried him for the Green Man attacks. He was found guilty in 1967 and was sentenced to life in prison. DeSalvo recanted his confession to being the Boston Strangler, but DNA evidence has since connected him with at least one of the crimes. In 1973, just six years into his sentence, DeSalvo was stabbed to death in the prison infirmary. Robert Wilson, an inmate with known connections to Boston's Winter Hill Gang, was put on trial for the murder, but it ended in a hung jury. DeSalvo's attorney, F. Lee Bailey, claimed that his client was killed for selling drugs for less than the standard price. While many believe Wilson is responsible for his death, the identity of his murderer officially remains unknown. 1. Roger Kibb Infamously known as the I-5 Strangler, Roger Kibb murdered at least eight victims between 1977 and 1987 before getting caught and landing in prison for life in 1991. He found all but one of his victims on the freeways around San Francisco and brutally bound and assaulted them before taking their lives. Kibb strangled his victims to death, which is also how he died at the hands of a fellow inmate at Mule Creek State Prison in 2021. The 81-year-old was found dead in his cell, with his cellmate, Jason Boudreaux, standing next to his body. Boudreaux, a self-proclaimed Satanist and convicted murderer, took responsibility for killing Kibb. In a five-page letter to the East Bay Times, he described his very deliberate plan. He wrote that he initially plotted to kill Kibb as a way to get his own cell, but decided he also wanted to avenge the I-5 Strangler's victims. The letter also explains how Boudreaux was confident that even if a prosecutor attempted to pursue the death penalty against him, a jury would never impose it based on all the horrific things Kibb did. He was charged with first-degree murder, and as predicted, the prosecutors did not seek the death penalty. Number 9. Ian Bonnock after enduring a rocky eight-year marriage, 39-year-old Katie Bonnock separated from her bodybuilder husband, 43-year-old Ian Bonnock. She obtained a restraining order against him in 2022. After dropping off their two kids with a sitter one day, she went to Ian's home in Fort Dinod, Florida, to collect some of her belongings and never returned. The next day, police found a jawbone and burn pile on Ian's property along with a 50-gallon barrel filled with decomposing body parts. They charged him with first-degree murder, as well as possession of a controlled substance for having steroids without a prescription. Ian was also federally charged for having 13 unregistered silencers that were found in his home. He admitted that he was angry at Katie for filing a domestic violence injunction against him. 
according to a federal complaint. Katie's cousin Annie Moore told the Daily Beast that Katie said Ian was violent against her throughout their entire relationship and that he had a bizarre tendency of citing scripture when he was angry. Annie also said that she once saw Ian throw a sippy cup so hard that it broke a window during a family gathering. In her words, he just wasn't right and wasn't normal. She also believes that Ian purposely moved Katie to the middle of nowhere and kept her as isolated as possible from her family and friends. Sadly, just when it seemed like Katie had escaped and started a new life, it was taken from her. If convicted, Ian could face life in prison or the death penalty. Number 8. Danny Reardon Early one morning in 2014, police were called to a residence in Edgewood, Florida. They were greeted by a screaming woman who was later identified as 24-year-old professional bodybuilder Danny Reardon. She was accused of hitting her boyfriend Ian Schofield and damaging his truck in retaliation for him, noticing that she was tipsy and trying to take her home. Witnesses claimed that she also ripped plants out of the ground and hit several vehicles. Ian said that he didn't want to press charges against Danny for the alleged attack or damage to his truck, but the police decided to charge her with domestic battery and resisting arrest. Officers said that Danny reeked of booze and that they saw her beating the dashboard of a vehicle when they took her into custody. They also claimed that she slammed her head into the back of a seat after being put in the patrol vehicle. The young woman was booked and released with a scheduled court date. While the outcome of the case is unclear, it appears as though she's moved on from the incident and is still active in the bodybuilding world. Number 7. Killer Sally McNeil Military service and professional bodybuilding brought former Marines Sally and Ray McNeil together during the late 1980s. They married just months after meeting and within days Ray became physically and mentally abusive towards Sally and her two kids from a previous relationship. Sally was the main breadwinner for the family while Ray put all his time into pumping iron and preparing for competitions including the prestigious Mr. Olympia tournament. In addition to paying all of the family's expenses, Sally financed her husband's costly steroid use. She later claimed it was the root cause of his violent behavior. The marriage continued to deteriorate over the years. By the time Valentine's Day 1995 rolled around, Ray was having an affair. Sally was planning to leave him as soon as she gathered enough money to make a clean break but she never got the chance to do so because she shot Ray inside their home that night and was charged with murder. Prosecutor Dan Goldstein painted Sally out as a jealous, vindictive, and violent woman who killed her husband in cold blood because she was angry about his extramarital relationship. Sally's defense attorney argued that she suffered from battered woman syndrome and that she shot Ray in self-defense when he began to choke her in a fit of anger spurred by roid rage. She was convicted of second-degree murder in 1996 and sentenced to 19 years to life. Sally was released in 2020 at the age of 60 after serving 25 years. And while she maintains she shot Ray in self-defense, she's focused on making the most of her newfound freedom, which includes a full-time job and a new marriage. She also starred in a Netflix documentary about her life called Killer Sally. Number 6. Chase Kelly during the early morning hours of June 1, 2021, 84-year-old Mildred Whitmore was found strangled and beaten to death in her home in the English town of Nuneaton. The evidence led police to 31-year-old bodybuilder Chase Kelly, who had recently discharged himself from a nearby hospital for blood pressure issues. A nurse said that he had taken 10 times the prescribed amount of amphetamines for his post-traumatic stress disorder and appeared agitated when he left. Officers found the troubled man in a public park, half-naked and in a confused state. They charged him with murder. An investigation found that Kelly had also been injecting steroids and drank a half a bottle of vodka shortly before Whitmore's murder, despite his doctor's warnings not to take his prescription medication with drugs or alcohol. His lawyer argued that he was experiencing a psychotic episode when he entered the senior citizen's home and killed her. Judge Mark Wall took no mercy on these mental health claims, stating that imprisonment was the only option and that Kelly didn't need hospitalization. He described how the defendant victimized a defenseless elderly woman who lived alone while she was asleep in bed, where she should have been safe, giving her no chance to save herself. 
Kelly pleaded guilty to manslaughter with diminished responsibility and was sentenced to a minimum of nine years in prison. Number five, Paul Bashy. In what attorneys later described as a Roy Drade attack, 35-year-old Michigan bodybuilder Paul Bashy was captured on camera brutally assaulting his girlfriend, 22-year-old Christina Perry, in 2018. In the disturbing footage, he could be seen kicking and throwing lit candles at the young woman inside his Washington Township rental home. The video also showed Bashy's arm covered in blood while he hurled a canister at Perry, who was cornered against a wall and sofa. Police charged Bashy with assault and with intent to murder and with a felony drug offense after reportedly finding cocaine, marijuana, methamphetamines, and human growth hormone inside his home. Assistant Macomb County Prosecutor Jordan Fields accused Bashy of beating the victim time and time again as she lay motionless and said that he had no idea how she survived the attack. He said that Perry was kicked more than 100 times and stabbed repeatedly over a 40-minute period. Bashy's attorney, David Graham, told the court that his client was using a great quantity of steroids in preparation for a national bodybuilding competition when the attack occurred. Three years later, in 2021, Bashy agreed to plead no contest to the assault, but he was taken into custody and his bond was revoked just days before his scheduled sentencing hearing, when he allegedly beat up his uncle with plans to skip town afterward to avoid prison time. He received a 14-year sentence despite Perry's wishes for the charges to be dropped. The couple stayed together and are now married. Number four, Gordon Kimbrough. During the early 90s, Gordon Kimbrough was known throughout the bodybuilding world as a chemical machine for his heavy steroid use, insanely strict diets, and grueling exercise routines. But his hard-earned success came tumbling down in 1993 when the 31-year-old fatally strangled and stabbed his girlfriend, 27-year-old Christy Ramsey, in an apparent steroid-fueled rage. Kimbra had returned home to San Francisco from a bodybuilding competition in North Carolina the previous day when Ramsey, who was also an award-winning bodybuilder, ended their four-year relationship. Members of the couple's inner circle told investigators that the couple exuded a healthy image, but their relationship was marked by strife and heavy steroid use behind closed doors. Police charged him with murder. Ramsey's death came amid a spate of at least 20 killings that had been committed by steroid-using men in the previous seven years, highlighting the nation and bodybuilding industry's growing problem at the time with performance-enhancing drugs. Kimbrough's family pleaded with the court for leniency. In a dramatic display, his sister, Danita Alcock, clung to a Bible and said that her brother committed his crime in a fit of passion after being unexpectedly rejected by the ideal woman of his dreams. But the judge saw this as no reason to go easy on Kimbra and imposed the maximum sentence of 27 years to life. Number three, Dr. Bruce Nadler. As an avid bodybuilder and the self-described world's strongest plastic surgeon, Dr. Bruce Nadler was well known in both amateur and professional circles for his expertise on correcting breast development in men who use steroids. He was also favored among bodybuilders for his tolerant views of steroid use. As an open user of them himself, he said that he saw himself as a test laboratory and adamantly believed that he could come up with a proper and safe combination of drugs that avoided negative side effects. But the New York State Board of Professional Medical Contact was less than impressed by Nadler's claims, and his lifestyle led to an investigation into his professional life. He was charged with misconduct and ultimately lost his license after it was discovered that he was prescribing anabolic steroids, growth hormones, and other performance-enhancing medications to patients without a valid medical reason for doing so. Nadler was also accused of several other offenses, including failing to perform thorough examinations and failing to keep adequate medical records for his patients. After being forced into retirement in the early 2000s, Nadler wrote a book called The Nip Tuck Workout. In 2005, he moved to Los Angeles where he and his wife Terry opened up Nip Tuck Fitness in Beverly Hills. Not a lot is known about what happened between then and early 2008 when Bruce and Terry were found dead in their home from gunshot wounds to the head. Officials ruled the tragedy a murder-suicide and concluded that Bruce was the responsible party. The only person that could ever explain the tragedy is Bruce himself, and he took that secret to the grave. Many speculated that he was depressed over the downward spiral his life took after he lost his medical license. 
It's unclear whether he was using steroids at the time of his death. Number two, Wayne Jones. After ending an on and off relationship with 48-year-old Welsh bodybuilder Wayne Jones in 2022, the ex-girlfriend caught him putting a tracking device to her car. She yelled at him and he left the scene. The woman then began to think about past run-ins with Jones and realized that he'd been tracing her whereabouts for some time. She searched her car and found that there was already a tracking device on it. Shortly thereafter, Jones showed up at her home demanding to see her and threw stones at the house when she refused. He returned a few days later and demanded the return of his tracking device and accused the woman of seeing a new man. The victim called the police, who found Jones hiding in some bushes outside the home. He told officers that he thought his ex had a man in the house, but that wasn't their concern. They warned Jones that he would be arrested if he didn't leave. He left, but he didn't leave the woman alone. Instead, he bombarded her with insulting and threatening text messages. She called the police again, and as officers were leaving her house, they spotted another tracking device on her car. Not far from the residence, they found Jones sitting in his car. This time, he was arrested. It was revealed in court they'd had a lengthy record of convictions dating back to 1990, including crimes against previous partners. In the case involving the most recent ex-girlfriend, he pleaded guilty to stalking with causing serious alarm or distress. Jones blamed his steroid use for some of his past bad behavior. The judge described him as immature and insecure and said that he needed to learn that women aren't property and that Jones' exes have the right to live how they want and see who they want. He was sentenced to nine months in prison, half of which would be served behind bars before being released on parole, and he was ordered to stay off steroids. And at number one, Chris Benoit. Tragedy struck the professional wrestling world in 2007 when WWE wrestler and former world heavyweight champion Chris Benoit killed his wife and son and then took his own life. Police discovered their bodies inside the family's Fayetteville, Georgia home after Benoit's employers became concerned about his absence and requested a welfare check. The murder-suicide immediately sparked suspicions that the beefed-up bodybuilder suffered from roid rage. Wrestling officials denied that this couldn't have been the case because Benoit's actions occurred over a several-day span, which they claim indicated that his behavior was premeditated. But roid rage comes in many forms, according to Slate journalist Michelle Tsai, who wrote shortly after the incident that symptoms often include paranoia, mania, mood swings, impatience, and uncontrollable aggression. Steroids can also cause depression and suicidal thoughts. Tsai also pointed out that roid rage can occur in short outbursts or cyclical bouts or a lengthy psychotic episode making it seem all the more possible that Benoit was under the influence of performance-enhancing drugs. An investigation found that Benoit and other wrestlers had illegally obtained steroids that were not in compliance with WWE standards in the year leading up to his death. There was also speculation that years of having his head banged around in the ring may have caused behavior-altering brain damage. Tests revealed that he had an advanced form of dementia and that his brain resembled that of a typical 85-year-old with injuries that are also known to cause depression and suicidal tendencies. After the findings regarding Benoit's brain condition and drug use came to light, WWE removed any mention of the disgraced athlete from its website. Thanks for watching. Would you rather discover that your partner was secretly using steroids or be faced with the choice of either dropping out of a prestigious athletic competition or using steroids to measure up to the other contestants. Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you soon, bye for now.